People say, well, Tom, you can't do both. You can't lift weights and do all the martial arts too. And I'm like, really, watch me, I, I'll do it. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 648, with my guest today, Hanchi Thomas Lebrun. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and I love martial arts. So I said, hey, let's start a company that does a whole bunch of cool martial arts stuff like this show. Want to go deeper on this or any episode we've ever done? Check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. You're going to find links and videos and photos and transcripts and you can sign up for the newsletter while you're over there you want to check out the other stuff we do because we do a whole bunch of stuff you can go to whistlekick.com and one of the things you'll find there in addition to the references to everything we're involved in is our store it's one of the ways that we monetize what we do and if you find something in the store you want use the code podcast15 saves you 15 percent on anything over there and well Why do we do what we do? Well, we make the show to connect and educate and entertain. And we do the overall stuff, the whole brand of Whistlekick. It's really just to support and give context to you, the traditional martial artist. I have a personal goal that we get everyone in the world to train for six months. I think if we do that, the world would be a better place. And that's why we bring you two episodes of this show each and every week. So if you want to show your support, yeah, you could buy something at the store, but here are a few other things that you could do. You could leave a review on Google or Apple Podcasts or Facebook. You could tell someone about the show. Maybe share something that we put out on social media. You can follow us. We're at Whistlekick. You could buy a book. We've got a ton of books. Some of them are based on podcasts. Some of them are not over on Amazon. Or you could support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. If you think that the show that you're going to listen to is worth 63 cents, well, then you might want to consider the $5 tier and we're going to give you stuff coming back, exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. And you get bonus exclusive merch, stickers, and and depending on the tier you're in, we give you more stuff. It's it's a great way to give back and to connect. It's a whole other sideline. We're just throwing stuff at you any way we can because we appreciate you. And I appreciated today's guest. Thomas LeBron has, man, has he done some really cool stuff. We just finished up an incredible episode, a little longer than our normal ones, because he had so much to say. And I don't want to spoil anything, but let's just say there's some name dropping going on here that surpasses any name dropping than we've ever had. Super cool. And uh, you're just going to dig it. So I'm just going to get out of the way and we're going to start. Thomas LeBron, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yes. Now, I, I know a little bit about what we're going to talk about, and you've got some stories queued up that, let's just say, I don't think in the six years we've been doing this, the hundreds of guests we've had, I don't think anybody's had these sorts of stories, at least not at, let's call it the A-list level. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, there's certainly been, it's been a, um, it's been quite a journey. And again, uh, it's a path less chosen by many people Mm. um, in the uh, martial arts world. Many people that have done, I I just want to tell the listener that um, I got involved with close protection, which means in layman's terms, I'm a bodyguard. Yeah. And uh, so how could, where did I come from, first of all, that, that, qualified me to do that type of work and i think that's where where the whole story kind of begins um my thought process and there's some humor in there and and i think people will will kind of sometimes do some self-reflection on well uh this man did this you know uh he had a vision uh, as an early child and and he grew up and and accomplished many things um so that's where i want to go with with this interview um for the listeners to say nothing's impossible and i'm just a, i'm a, i'm an upper valley guy i grew up here in lebanon enfield area you know, most of my life and uh 
So it's not like I lived in New York City or, or L.A. and hobnob with the Hollywood elite. I had to do this on my own, and um, it was a lot of hard work. So, wow. But here I am. You know. I, I mentioned in the pre-show that I was a couple hours north. I, I'm only an hour north of you then. Yes. I'm, right. in, I'm in Montpelier. Yes. Well, we're, we're going to take that ride. We're, we're going to get there. But of course, it's it's a martial arts show, and this is a martial arts subject that we're getting into you said the past path less traveled so what what's the beginning of that path you know at some point you had your your origin as a martial artist what what was the what's the story about that as a a very young child um let's say at age five and we'll build into this at at age five i wanted to be superman you know how often do you hear that from kids they want to grow up and be a superhero and and save the world and all that yeah well you know i had that superman outfit on and that actually that actual picture is in my book um so my dream to my dad is you know one day dad i'm going to fly around the world and protect people and he said sure you are i mean uh, how many parents would actually think their child would grow up and you know, don the glasses and the cape, you know, so forth. <laughs> so, um, so unfortunately, at age six, I, I, I got in a bad car accident. A uh, car ran over me, and I was not allowed to do any physical exercise for about a year. So all I did was watch Kung Fu Theater on TV on Sundays and big-time wrestling and um, whatever else other program was on there. And I really digested many of these things um how they moved with the martial arts and so forth and that's me at six years old till seven and i would see jack the lane on tv that goes way back and i'd be doing the push-ups and all that stuff and getting myself you know in shape and i didn't know what that word meant back then but i felt pretty good about it um and as time went on you know, my heroes were Superman and Hercules and Tarzan and all that stuff. But look at these guys. I mean, they got, they're got big and got the physiques and so forth. And I, and I bought my share of comic books like every young, a, a young child would. And um, I go, well, how, how could I do my version of being Superman? And can I take care of myself? So um, at age 13 or so, I said I saw a picture of Steve Reeves who played Hercules many years ago, 1959, 1960. How did that guy get so big? And they said he lifts weights. Uh, show me these weights. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, they, people showed me weights, and I just started lifting weights and so forth. And I also saw an ad in a comic that it was Charles Atlas. Don't let somebody kick sand in your face, and, and that really resonated with me. And he had a chorus, and he's all, and he was doing dynamic tension. I'm lifting weights, and my dad told me to do isometrics. It's better for me, and, and I, of course, I disagreed, and I kept lifting. And and um, I had set up a burlap bag in the woods, and now we're probably age fourteen. And Joe Frazier was my hero. He, Joe Frazier, won the Olympics in 1964. And uh, I kept following his career, and I put two burlap bags filled with dirt and, and sand in the woods hanging down from a tree, unbeknownst to my parents. And I put my winter gloves on. I'd go out there every day and, and whack away on this heavy bag and uh, just keep just kept going. And, and I said, I've I got to make myself be able to take care of things because I want to give it my version of Superman through my life. And I come home and my gloves are all shredded and I told them that the dog ate them. So they bought me a new pair of gloves and because uh, they were winter gloves. <laughs> and I just kept thinking about that. And as I lifted weights, I was getting bigger and getting more confidence in myself. And it wasn't until 73, so now I'm 18 years old, going on 19. And... Um, I was, I was, you know, I had a fair amount of muscle on me, and I followed Bruce Lee, which, who was like 60 pounds lighter than I was, and he's moving like the wind, and, and I'm like, wow, this guy is really fast, and and I'd like to be like Bruce Lee, but I also want to be, still want to be that Superman to to whoever, and I'd watch David Carradine 
on the mm-hmm. Kung Fu series. And, um, you know, I didn't want to be the grasshopper. <laughs> if you will. And, and I, but I liked the animal system and the Kung Fu and all that. So I, I walked into this dojo, they were doing judo and I walked in, I was all that. And I, and I thought that, you know, I, I was a big man and I was, you know, bigger than most there. And, and the instructor came over and he said, okay, he said, you want to learn this stuff? Swing, swing, swing at me. So I swung and he flipped me over his head and I landed on the mat and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, I, I wasn't ready. You know, <laughs> we, I think we've all gone through that. And he said, no, this time I really want you to mean it. I really want you to swing. I go, okay, all right. So I swung really hard and, and I missed the mat that time. He flipped me so far. I stood up and brushed myself off, and the only thing that was hurt was, I guess, my pride. And I said, okay, sign me up. So I lost a few pounds, became much more athletic, and I delved myself into the world of judo. And I uh, was doing quite well, and the instructor informed me that he was moving out of town. I'm like, wow, oh, okay, but I got some judo under my belt, and this is this good. So the next instructor was in White River Junction, Vermont. He was built like Bruce Lee, so I really resonated with him and told him, you know, God, you look just like Bruce Lee and build and all this stuff. And he did Taekwondo, and his kicks were really high. And here I am, a 210-pound big guy that um, was not nearly as flexible as he was. And he did some things that just wowed me. And some of the movements he did, the speed, and I'm like, wow, this is great. So here I am in the world of Taekwondo, a giant among other students. <laughs> and um, we'd go out every once in a while, and he'd always say, is it okay if I hang out with you? This was a, this guy, Master Kim. And I go, yeah, sure, you can hang out. We'd, we'd go to some of the bars and so forth. And he would tell people, he goes, I feel so safe with my big buddy Tom here. And you know, I look at him like, yeah, right, you know, because he was he was the master. I wasn't. <laughs> and uh, so we kept we kept training. We kept giving it that diligent training and I'm still lifting weights. And people say, Well, Tom, you can't do both. You can't lift weights and do all the martial arts too. And I'm like, really? Watch me. I, I'll do it. It's fine. I'm boxing. I'm, I'm doing judo. I'm doing taekwondo. And I kept going over these moves. I'd always have these, these burlap bags filled with dirt and stuff. And I'd flip them and I, anything I could do to make myself different, but using the same techniques. I mean, I was training like old school and, um, people start recognizing that, um, as as my as my years went on, I'm getting I'm getting better and, and more adept into this martial arts world. Only to hear my Taekwondo instructor say that he's moving out of town. Mm. I'm like, oh, it must be something I said. I don't know. You know, <laughs> something something in the water. <laughs> something is. Yeah. So I I went to another instructor and and studied Kempo, Okinawan Kempo, and. And I end up winning, you know, like um, a karate guy of the month. And, and I was kind of going through the belt system and so forth and very pleased with my progress. And I'm still lifting weights and I've still heard, well, you can't lift weights and do this stuff too. And I'm like, well, I'm still going to. So, you know, that's just the way I am. I enjoy working out, whatever that workout might be. Um, my dad had brought me up working hard, building stone walls and all sorts of stuff. So lifting weights is just, for me, it's just a very natural thing to stay in shape and running and stretching and all that stuff. So a long story short, I entered um, the strongest man in New England in 1984 and was the smallest guy there and placed second place by one point. And there were some big, big boys there. there was, again, there's no weight classes whatsoever. And then six months later, I achieved my showdown in the Kempo system. So indeed, I could do both at the same time. Um, my self-defense skills, uh, as it was written in the paper, were really good. Um, so I felt a sense of pride. Bu- building up, I'm going to go back a couple of years, but building up to that, all the training and what is what was it that I trained? What was the environment? Well, I was a I worked the doors over in White River at a couple of the establishments, and I did that for six years, six nights a week, 
and there were times where people wanted to um, pick fights with me and kind of take the head guy off the hill, and that happened to be me. Um, and they would come at me with all sorts of implements and uh, bottles and ashtrays and all that stuff. Um, and I did what I had to do to make the environment safe for other people, uh, the patrons that wanted to go there to enjoy themselves. So in my book, it says Strongman Days, Roadhouse Nights, like in the Patrick Swayze movie. <laughs> so <laughs> Classic. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of basic training as to attack modes and blading and posturing and all that stuff um de-escalation of violence came into play and got my show done but i knew that i wanted to keep going with making atmospheres safe for people so i kind of veered somewhat from traditional martial arts um to say what actually works on the street. And, you know, these people were coming at me with all sorts of stuff, and I'm still here and filled out many a report. And in my book is, you know, um, people talking about my job there in White River Junction and, and how it made an impact on the patrons and so forth. So um, I, I was very... Um, honored that they wrote me letters way back then. And um, so it just said, I, I was on the right path, but what, what more did I have to do? So going through the Kempo system for, I would say, eight or nine years, and then I shifted over to a grandmaster here in White River, um, grandmaster Brett Mayfield, um, showed me a lot of really good things. And I think in the beginning, I found myself on the floor more often than not. And different pressure point applications and and another instructor came in, we worked on Aikido things. So now my art, my whole system that I'm now in my head trying to create has taken on a different feel, a different way of moving because I still weigh 210, but I'm moving much differently as more of an athlete or I would call it martial ballet, if you will, um, in, in working with within the world of self-defense uh, because that's what I'm doing. I'm defending other people's lives, a third party. So from there, I started getting, this is where it starts getting very, very interesting is that I was a part-time officer for Lebanon and there was something missing. I enjoyed doing the work, but there was something missing. And in 1988, I handed in my gear and said, tomorrow I'm going into the security business. So this was September, 1988. So 33 years ago. And, um, the captain said, um, uh, you know, you don't have any government experience. You have no police experience. You have no, uh, military background. Um, where are you going to go with this work? I said, I'm going to travel all over the world protecting people and using my discipline in order to do it right. And it's not about the physical so much that it is about academics and self, uh, self awareness and so forth and, and situational awareness and, and whatnot. Um, so that was 1988 and I was married at the time until my, well, it's the same thing. I said, you know, I, I got done at my job at the police station and, and I'm going to go into security work tomorrow and I'll be going to every capital city in the world to protect people. And she said, sure you are. And um, I'm like, okay. So uh, in, my, in my head, and this is where the vision kind of comes in that people say that, that um, things are impossible to do. I kind of turn it around and say, well, then how am I going to do it? What's the road that I need to take to make this all happen? Martial arts-wise, uh, I found from Brett Mayfield, I found a, a gentleman down in um, New Jersey, Michael DePasquale Jr. and Sr., who I, who, who I met um so about that time, it would have been a couple of years later. Um, but I started developing my business, you know, 1989, 1990, 
And then 91, 1990, I was asked to go on tour with Madonna. And she needed three people. I was number four. So I, I, I'm like, well, I'm getting closer. Um, and how did, how did that actually happen? Is the, yeah. I had bumped into a friend of mine in West Lebanon who worked for Michael Jackson. And I said, I'd really like to get into the entertainment industry. How would I do that in the security world? He was a sound technician. He said, well, if you were to ever come out to Hollywood, he said, I would give you some numbers. And then it's up to you to stay in touch with these people and promote yourself and so forth. And I'm like, okay. So two weeks later, I booked a flight to Hollywood and um, early 1989. And he said, well, I didn't actually think you were coming. <laughs> so I got out there. Surprise. And he said, I, yeah, right. I said, I, he said, I better give you some phone numbers. And um, so he did. And, and I started staying in touch with everybody. Now, prior to all of this, we all remember back in 1980-ish when John Lennon was shot. And, and it had to do with the stalker mentality. Now, for whatever reason, I saved those papers. I still have them today. That whole story about Mark David Chapman stalking John Lennon and then, then the, the shots rang out and so forth at the Dakota. And I'm like, well, I got to study this a little bit more. So I kind of got into that at the same time as I went out to Hollywood and really digested all I needed to know and bought the books and talked to the police department. They gave me some of their their laws on stalking and and um, victims and so forth. And um, so I really got into it. I said, you know, I might be using this to my advantage because how many people out there track down these people to make the client safer? So I put that in my back pocket, if you will. Mm. So back to Madonna, she needed three people. I was number four, so I didn't get the job. And so I'm doing small security type jobs and small establishments. And then I went to, I was called to Washington to do a big investigative job uh, the summer of 91. And um, I went down there for 10 weeks and did, we ended up winning the case. Uh, meanwhile, everywhere I went, I'm practicing. I'm constantly practicing my, my skills and art and so forth. And, and, um, in the book, there's a lot of description of, of people watching me in the middle of the night at this uh, gas station I used to work at, just practicing the techniques. And they said they didn't really want to stop by. They just watched me. <laughs> so I got back from Washington. And I got a phone call to say, would you like to be the head of security for a big concert at Maple Valley down by Brattleboro? And it was Steppenwolf concert. They were, there was nine bands. Steppenwolf was the ninth band. And so I'm like, well, who do you, you know, what do you expect for an audience? And they said, you know, a bunch of motorcyclists and Hells Angels will be there and so forth. I'm like, okay. So I enlisted the services of two chiefs of police and two guys with German shepherds. And that's what our team was. And uh, the end of the day, um, well, during the actual concert, somebody tried to get violent with me and I told my team, I said, I have it. And, and it didn't work out well for the other person. Um, but I'm never mad at anybody. Um, the state police said that day that it was the easiest concert they've ever had to work. So I took that with a lot of self pride and, and, um, very, so I'm heading in the right direction, you know, yeah. with, with all this security stuff and I'm doing the right thing, working with the right people. And, and I wanted to make a name for myself. So I kept, I kept working. So the concert gets over with, I think I had to go away for another couple of weeks working some labor disputes. So I was always protecting the corporate end and, uh, people are on strike, um, and I'm on the corporate end, making sure that the the um, corporate officers were were safe and so forth. They could go to and from the plant or make sure their families were okay. So I did that. I did that a number of times. Um, but coming off that one that that job for it lasted a couple of weeks, I got home and my wife said somebody by the name of Mark has called from 
from Boston, and he said something about the new kids on the block. I'm like, okay, give me his number. So I call him up and he says, how would you like to go on the last world tour with the new kids on the block? I was like, sure. So he said, well, meet me at Fenway Park on Thursday and we'll talk about it. So I drove down to Boston and because the other guy didn't show up that was, um, was uh, I guess, in contention with me, he didn't show up. So I automatically got the job by default and we worked out some details and he said, well, you'll be in London next Thursday. And my passport ready. So the following week, I'm off on a plane to London, and we did a world tour um, in Europe for eight weeks. Wow! Came I want to I want to press pause if we can, because yeah. yeah. we we we've been going, and and I want to I want to rewind the tape, and there's some stuff that I want to I want to suss out of this, if, if I may. Yeah. Yes. Because when, when, when somebody comes on the show and they say, you know, I, I was inspired to protect people by, you know, and, and you named off, you know, some, some very powerful figures right. from sports and media uh, role models that plenty of people have had in common. Right. And of course, you know, you, you talked about how it seemed like everybody around you, including your wife, was dismissive of <laughs> these aspirations that you had. And of course... You know, now now that we're 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 getting into some of the chapters of your life, we're seeing that these things are unfolding. But I want to go back and I want to try to understand where the desire to protect people came from. Now, if 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 I if I may dig a little bit, in my experience, when someone makes it a priority to protect others. It's because someone else did not make it a priority to protect them. Hmm. Is there a story like that for you? And if so, are you willing to share it? Uh, there isn't. Um, I um, I don't know. I always I always resignated. I I could always take care of myself, even as a child. Um, people were picking on me and so forth, and, and I wouldn't. I, I guess I wouldn't take any any crap or whatever you want to call it from these kids, even as a young, young boy. And, and, um, it just kept, it just kept bouncing off me that I wanted to protect people. I wanted to protect, I, I guess in school, you see the nerds in school, the, 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 and I was one of those people. Um, but I was also athletic. So the ones that, are very studious, but not athletic, but they're extremely smart and they were being picked on and they're bullies. And it wasn't until early high school that I saw that, that these guys were being picked on. And I would, they would come up to me and say, can you tell someone so to quit, quit picking on me? And I said, uh, sure. So I'd walk up to the person and say, can you quit picking on this gentleman? They go, what are you going to do, beat us up? They go, probably. So just quit, quit, quit picking on them. So I never had a fight in school, but yet I deterred the, the fight from happening or okay. prevented okay. somebody from being picked on. So, it, I, But I always, even before that, I had that vision of, of being my version of Superman. It always, you know, truth, you know, the, the whole Superman thing, I, it just was part of who I am, I guess. And then as I got to high school, I'm getting older and bigger and so forth. I just didn't like seeing other people being picked on. Mm. And, and then, it, then I just have gone through life that way, that mm. somebody got picked on that can't protect themselves. So mm. now we get into this chapters or chapters about people but let's say back in the bar years and people just want to have a good time. You want to go to a bar and you want to dance. You want to have a couple of drinks, but you want things to get out of hand. You don't want people to be pushing you around all that stuff. And it was my job to make sure that it was a, a, a wonderful, safe atmosphere. And for those people that, that had a difference of opinion, they were no longer allowed there. And I would work with the police and making sure they were removed. Um, so I've always had that that spirit in me about doing that type of work. I just didn't know how to get there. You know, I didn't have a roadmap. 
And but everybody, like you said, everybody kept trying to dissuade me or just dis- discourage me from pursuing it or didn't think it was possible, which made me even more determined to make it possible. All right. So and, and I I would imagine, you know, as you know, you, you described yourself as a nerd who fell into martial arts. I was also a nerd yeah. in martial arts. And one of the things that I can say about nerds is they tend to go pretty deep on subjects they're interested in. So I, I'm going to guess, and, and, and this is probably a good time. I've done the extreme junior version of security. I, I, I worked uh, some events in college, mostly concerts. Yeah. And, you know, we got briefings and it was... You know, if we did our jobs right, nothing happened. It was about observation. It was about heading things off, you know, things that we talk about within martial arts. So what I'm finding really interesting is it sounds like you in this industry started to progress very quickly. And I'm going to guess that it's on the back of your nerdy martial arts tendencies. Yes. I mean, even today, I mean, here, here we are. I'm in my late 60s <laughs> um here i'm writing a book so here comes the nerdiness about writing <laughs> yeah and so i've always been very studious but i also have always been an athlete and very focused very disciplined and i and i read voraciously even in the, my younger years like how did someone get from point a to point b Right. And then, then I would find the answer. Wow. He took this road. Okay. He came from nothing and became a millionaire. As I got older, I'm going to say 1986, I started listening to Tony Robbins in Power Talk and I still have the cassette tapes downstairs. <laughs> cassette tapes. I love Tony Robbins. Right. So you'll love the stories coming up about it, but, um, so I started listening to him, and what Tony did was take my vision in listening to these tapes and reframe it. So I'm like, okay, now that makes sense. So if I apply that to my vision, I'm going to be able to do things that people would think are impossible and make them possible. But I have to take action to this passion, to this vision that I had. And people, you know, would, would as, you know, if, if you don't, people don't understand having a really deep vision about something that you really want to do, follow through with it. A lot of times people go, I have this vision, I can do this, but that's not possible. And then they don't, then they don't pursue it. I've never been afraid of taking a chance. Now, have I been successful in everything I've done? The answer is no, but I've been pretty close. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For instance, when I was doing a lot of Taekwondo and Kempo and so forth, I would jump up and kick somebody's holding a a belt or a hat over their head. I jump up and kick the hat. Then I would say, stand on a chair. So they stand on the chair. They would hold the hat at shoulders height, standing on a chair, and jump up and kick the hat. I said, now hold it over your head. Now jump up and kick that. So in the book, there's a letter of me jumping up and kicking the net just below the rim. Wow. So people would say, can you do that now? I said, no. I said, I was humbled by gravity. You know? <laughs> um, but things like that, I had a vision of doing it, so I did it. And people would say, that's kind of, that's, that's nine feet in the air. I go, I was upside down, then I had to come down and land on my feet. Um, so that's part of the martial arts discipline that I have is doing things. And, and it's not just martial arts discipline. It's just my inner workings that when people tell me, I don't think you can do that. Then I and I have this vision. Then I go out and try it. Go out and do it. Make take action, and generally I can get pretty close. Um, my dream was to be on major tours with major recording artists, bar none. And and that's exactly what I did. And the more you do it, the more successful you are. And like you said, if you do the job right, it's a boring story. 
Um, but there's always an X factor. There's always a human factor that you couldn't have possibly trained for or saw it coming because I might be the only one there. And um, which in, in further in our story today, there's many times that I'm the only guy protecting. And um, I've had some wonderful clients and I do my job and and I haven't stopped yet. Um, so I continue to train every bit as hard. I'm, I'm probably training harder now than when I was in my 40s. Um, Why? Why? It, 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 I, you know, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> that's why I asked it. It is a very good question. Because it doesn't sound like you, you were the type of person who wouldn't have been training hard in their 40s. Yeah. Maybe you were busier. Maybe you had more yeah, for, uh, logistical constraints. Yeah, I think, I think um, a few years ago, both my parents passed away. Mm. And, and for 10 years, I, I, I looked out for them. And they we shared a house, and and I did the right thing with them, and they both passed almost at the same time. So we became not only family, father, mother, and son, and I have siblings, but we became friends and support for each other. Mm-hmm. And I was there for their each of their last breaths on earth. Um, Mom died in August and dad died a couple of months later of a broken heart. Um, once I, once I um, settled the estate and all that stuff, that took me into the end of 2019. And then 2020, I started writing my book. So, but after, as I'm writing the book, I had a renewed energy and a second wind. So right now I'm in that peak again of training very hard emotionally and uh, physically. Um, And there's a joke to go with that. We'll get to there at the end. (laughs) Um, But that's, that answers your question. I, I just have this innate desire to train as hard as I can, and I never do anything halfway. Um, As you'll find out as we keep talking, I've never done anything without a global theme in mind, without a, a top-notch effort, if you will. I give it my best effort. If I give this, whatever this is for you or me, if I give this my best effort and the best version of myself to that particular discipline or that particular job, then I can I can clearly come back and say I gave it my best effort and and here is my reward for doing that and I've always been that way um, just not I compete with myself if you will if I work for new kids and I need to work with someone higher up than that and um, so that I think does that answer your question Yeah yeah, uh, it, yeah. it does it does it, yeah. it you know it. To say it another way, and, and I'm curious if if you agree with what I heard, yeah. you're going to throw whatever you have at whatever's in front of you. Yeah. And at this point in your life, there are fewer, and I don't use the word insensitively, let's call them distractions. Right. And thus you are able to focus more on your training. Right. Yeah, the training now is just, I mean... I'm, I'm writing a new book and I'm actually trying to get characters in the book. So, you know, that's funny when people start laughing. <laughs> this other guy must be in great shape. I said, of course he is. Because <laughs> um, I'm training six days a week and sometimes twice a day. So it's, it's gone. It's going pretty well. Um, so here I am. Here I am. We'll, we'll go back to new kids, if you don't mind. No, the, not at all. The the north, the uh, European part of the tour is eight weeks. Now I've never been on a, a full tour with any major act, and they said, Tom, the new kids on the block on this world tour is very similar to what the Beatles were like the screaming and the obsessive behavior of fans. And it's just not little kids. It's grown women and their boyfriends and their parents, <laughs> which, were, which were hard to deal with. Um, 
but you have to do that every single day. They come up on your floor and you're awake and sometimes you're not sleeping for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're doing the job. And I went in as a professional security guy, not a big buddy. And I would analyze certain things. And this world tour took us everywhere. And then I started raising my hand to say, I can do advance work, which means I'm getting us arrivals and departures from the airport. Everything else, I have a team working with me. And uh, so the airport's getting out of like Mexico City and Rio and all that stuff. I got to know how to do the advance work very well by studying and taking courses. And my academic level was probably every bit as important, if not more so than my physical, which means I didn't, didn't stop physically training. I just added the academics on the other end. Sure. Um, so we get over to Asia and we had a few problems over there. None that we, we couldn't handle, but I took the role of the advance guy and um, we like we had to negotiate a way out of the Philippines. And, and uh, I negotiate? Do you, do you mean bribe? Kind of, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a little bit how that part of the world works. <laughs> no, they did. I didn't. I, I just, I was just part of the lower the number. That's all. Um, and then I got to the airport and told them that, you know, it's been a, a whirlwind tour. And that to minimize the hysteria in the airport, this is the Philippines in Manila, uh, Manila in the Philippines. And I said, to minimize the hysteria in your airport, um, I would suggest that you make me a custom agent. And I was saying that in jest. And the guy said, well, you know, I really can't do that. I said, well, I could escort them to the VIP room and put them in there. And, but I need all access. So if you made me a custom agent, that would, that would really work well. And the guy said, you know, that's not a bad idea. So here I was a custom agent from another <laughs> airport, you know. <laughs> um, so we, we got done that tour very well and I learned a lot. And, um, so now, now this was a, March of 92 or so, I got over that. And I was really working out the whole group that I was with. There was five other guys. We'd always find a gym and work out. And, and it was the years of um, uh, Marky Wahlberg was in Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. So he would be with us as well, opening up for the new kids on the block, uh, Donnie Wahlberg and the gang. And uh, so we always go to the gym together. And we'd have some great workouts. Um, so they thought I was in better shape than the rest of the guys. But I said, that's because I, you know, work out all the time. And that's, I don't drink, I don't smoke, nothing. I just have a very disciplined life. Um, so meanwhile, I'm still training and so forth. And I'm being recognized for some martial arts things that I'm pulling uh, out, like a humanitarian award, um, because of my work in stalkers. Um, and then I, you know, I get home and I take a deep breath. Um, 1992, I think I did a couple of smaller jobs. And then I got a phone call. This gentleman called me up and said, Elton John wants to see you. And I said, okay, well, he needs to see you Sunday night. And so I'm going to be in New York um, teaching defensive tactics. And I won't be back till Sunday night. He said, well, this is Elton John. I said, well, that's fine. I said, this is... This is Tom LeBron. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I can't help you Sunday night, but I can certainly fly to wherever you are on Monday morning, and I'll deal with the issue. And it had to do with the stalkers that Elton had. So this whole thing comes in full circle about my study with stalkers and so forth, that I'm called for one of the most iconic male recording artists of all time to make sure that he's safe on the stage. And uh, so I certainly did my homework, and I still have all the folders and all that stuff with me. Um, but it's the it's the physical training that keep my that keeps my mind sharp, my body sharp, my the confidence that I've always had from training hard, and then the academic I'm able to study in such a way that it makes sense to me, and other people appreciate 
the effort that I put into that. Um, so anyway, Elton's still singing and, and I'm in the background and he didn't know I worked for him for three months. Um, it wasn't important to me that I got to meet him while he was singing and I was on contract. Uh, three months later, his assistant said, would you like to meet Elton? Elton? And I said, sure. So I met him and I said, this is the guy that's been keeping you on the stage. And he shook my hand and said, well, thank you. You've been doing a good job. <laughs> so, okay. Were you a fan of his? I was, yes. I still am. I love his, I like his songs. And, um, yeah, and you, the, the, everybody has treated me so well through the years. And, and, um, and we'll get to some of the other people that I worked with, but Elton treated me very well. His staff treated me well. Mm. But then I, I wanted to shift over, get out of the entertainment for a little while, um, because that's a very grueling work, even though I was able to work out and so forth. It's just very grueling being on a tour bus and going to the concerts and your ears take a beating. Um, and then, so after Elton, I got a job um, that I, I took a job that I really wasn't supposed to have in New York City. It was a corporate gentleman that was being threatened. And I didn't know any, I didn't have strong contacts in New York at the time. So I decided to do the job myself and told the guy, I said, I'll be flying down myself from New Hampshire. And, and he had brought another security guy with him. And as soon as I showed up, that their driver was sleeping behind the wheel. So I fired him and got another car service in there. I just took charge and I ended up having that corporate gentleman for 16 years and nobody ever threatened him after that. We had, I made contacts with NYPD and they were, they were brought on board when needed and I treated them very well. And to this day, um, I've been very well respected through that organization. Um, and the client is still with us. He lives out in Beverly Hills. And, and uh, I was very happy to have met him and worked for him for so long. Um, but during that whole time of 16 years, every once in a while, I'd be called away to do security for other people uh, because of my skill sets and so forth. So I would put NYPD on my client and I would take the other jobs as well. Um, so my business that I created in 1988, Nighthawk Security, was now, you know, a common word amongst the, the, some of the security people. And they knew that I would train, you know, endlessly and, um, running, lifting, working the bags, sparring with people, doing what if situations, you know, studying the close protection field. And, um, again, the path that I chose was just, it's, it's a unique path that I chose to go to the top versus I hear people say, well, yeah, I was a bodyguard to so-and-so when they were in Boston or when they were in New York. And they go, did you, were you actually with them? I said, I was with them all the time, regardless if we were in the United States or Vietnam or China or all these other places. So, you know, the, the, the whole my whole business I've been involved with people in forty five countries, um, so it, it's just been a a wonderful journey adventure, you know. But that doesn't mean I rest on my laurels. I think I I use that word very strongly. Yeah, and I don't rest on my laurels. I have to keep training harder, and I have to keep current with what's going on. That means technology. And that means um, terrorist activities and and uh, anniversary dates. And right now, you may not know this about me, but I'm a certified master anti-terrorist specialist through a company called ATAB. And that means a lot out there um, that I do that type of study. Um, and I'm also I also study a lot of medical procedures that we call 10 minute medicine, that if I were protecting you, that I would do enough to keep you alive before the paramedic showed up mm. and know different things to do. So there's much more to my program than standing around or <laughs> being looking like, you know, the tough guy. Or right. But that's everyone's vision of security is that you, you stand there physically in front of the person you're protecting. Right. 
and yeah. just look intimidating and that that's enough. Right. And if that was enough, it would be really easy. You right. would just, you know, the security details would look like the offensive line of a football team. Exactly right. And and some of these big guys, or a lot of them, very intelligent human beings, but sure. are they hired for their size or are they hired for their intelligence? And they, they can answer that question. I'm not a big guy, you know, I'm I'm big, but I'm not intimidatingly big. And the name of my book is called Hiding in Plain Sight. <laughs> um, so, you know, I really study hard in all aspects of the job. And again, I, I'm very blessed, I'm very fortunate, and I don't I don't I don't live off my laurels. I don't I don't rest and say, I can do this, therefore I can do that. I mean, you're only as good as your last job, so I have to make every job very successful. And um, so in in training, I, I met Michael DePasquale, junior and senior, in 1992 at Karate College down in Virginia and hit it off with Michael Sr. really well. And I started doing the combat jiu-jitsu courses and I was uh, awarded with my Shogun in combat jiu-jitsu, uh, Michael's uh, system. Um, then I would travel down to the Blessman School in New Jersey and train at this high school with all the guys. And uh, Tom Pateri is one of them, uh, Michael Sr. and Jr., and then there was other people there. Um, and then uh, in 1994... I was awarded my um, Sandan through that organization. Um, and I started getting more awards um, in the Eastern USA International Martial Arts Association for leadership and success. So it doesn't always have to be an award for fighting or, you know, the tough guy or a or whatever. Yeah. It's just they, they recognize a different, a different um, category, if you will, with what I've been doing. Um, and I kept honing the things that I knew and I started picking up the sticks and doing harness because that allowed me to move really freely and pivoting and so forth. And you put the sticks down, you pick up bladed instruments and how deadly are those? And if you put down those, can you do trapping as in Wing Chun? So I started studying as much as I could in many different arts. And, um, um, in the meantime, I'm getting phone calls because of my experience in the in the um, advanced work of the protective details. And I get a call one day would have been um, again. I just came off a big another big job. Uh, I got a phone call and said, "Would you like to go to South Africa, 1994?" And I said, "Who's the client?" They said, "Whitney Houston." Mm -hmm. And I said, um, "Sure." Um, no, at first I said, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I know the country is very violent and so forth. So we had conversation with the State Department. And they said, um, we would, would advise you not to go. Uh, Mandela had only been president for six months. And um, it's still kind of violent uh, in, in Africa, South Africa. Well, I said, um, she's still going to go. So I need to take, I need to get as much information as I can because I'm going first. So I fly out to South Africa by myself and start working on building a team in South Africa. Um, in can, can you can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by building a team? In building that a team, getting people that are established security people in South Africa that know the lay of the land much better than I do, and are security trained drivers. Um, and they would keep me from taking a wrong turn. <laughs> Got, it. Got um, it. But I have, I have taken pride in my diplomacy in foreign countries where I never say, well, in the U.S. we do things this way. And they always look at you and say, well, you're not in the U.S. right now. <laughs> um, I've never said that, but I've heard people say that, and I go, I'm not going to do that. I have to listen first and then tell what my program would entail and see if we can't find a happy medium and always have a plan B. So I did the advance to South Africa. There had been a pre-advance done, so I had some information to go on, but 
things change every five minutes over there, and the violence is is horrific. And so I got down there and, and met with a group of people, and we talked. And I said, let's go do the advance. So we're going from hotel to venue to to different sites, children's centers and all this, everywhere that we think that Whitney may want to go to. So the day came where they flew in from Cape Town. So it's not an international flight. Rather, it's a in-country flight. And they were on a 747. And I talked to the head of security and I said, I... I um, I want to bring this person through the airport. And for some reason, they didn't care for who I worked for. And I won't elaborate on that. And I said, well, I have plan B. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I have plan B. If I could bring all the vehicles underneath the wing of the jet, can we work that out to minimize any hysteria in your airport? And he goes, we can do that. So I silently pumped my fist. <laughs> and when the director of security came off the plane, he said, what do you have in place? And I said, see those 13 vehicles over there? And I said, those are ours. When they block the jet, the front wheels, I'm going to wave to them, and they're going to pull underneath the wings, and I want everybody to go down the jetway, down the metal stairs, and get in the car and make sure you save one for me. And he goes, sure you are. I'm like, okay. So I gave a wave, they came down, I walked in, I go, David, time to get these people down and leave two behind for luggage. And everybody got in the car, they saved a card for me, I called the hotel and I had some people there waiting and we drove in and the everything worked out great. So about a year later, I get another phone call and they said, how would you like to be our new head of security for Whitney Houston? And I, and I didn't say yes right off. My, my mindset was, I'm not that type of guy to just to jump into something because of the, the excitement of the moment. I would say to myself, what can I bring to the table that's unique and that, that is different than what other people have brought to the table that makes my program work? And it had to do with tracking down stalkers. And, um, so I said to them, yes, I'll take the job. We went over the figures and so forth. So I was Whitney's head of security uh, for a few years. And wow. that was just a wonderful experience. Meanwhile, I still had the corporate client from Los Angeles going in and out of New York. <laughs> so You were busy. I was busy, and so was NYPD. And, and yeah. I always had a hotel that I could work out at. And most of the hotels had heavy bags. And I was always working that and studying and looking at films and just researching the martial arts even more so. I needed to be that. If I'm in self-defense and it's a compilation of arts, then I needed to be that self-defense expert. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, did you at all appreciate, and I can't be the first one to bring this up, but yeah. did you appreciate the irony of, in, in a sense, being the bodyguard to a woman who became well-known for starring in a movie no, called Bodyguard. Bodyguard. I, I got the, I got all the, um, I got all the jokes that went along with that. <laughs> <laughs> I would even to this day, people go, oh, you're a bodyguard. I go, yeah, right. In layman's terms, that, that's what I am. But they go, but that, it, it's not like you worked for Whitney Houston or something like that, is it? I go, oh, I, <laughs> No, I did work for her. <laughs> You're kidding, right? I no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, that's that's funny. That's funny, yeah, and that's that's why I said, in a sense, bodyguard, because I understand the difference between yeah. the level yeah. of security that you were performing and and a lot of times bodyguard. Say, Tom was the inspiration for the movie. I said, no, I wasn't. It came out two years before I started, but you know, right. I okay, you know, I sometimes I really downplay it. But here's here's a, a, a female singer that was. Bar, bar none, one of the greatest singers of all time. And, and and I wanted to know that I could do the program to the best of my ability and keep her safe. And I did. And we had a mm. lot of fun moments together. And uh, there was a time where we walked down uh, Times Square together, just her and I. Somebody recognized her. I mean, that's not a hard. No, not. Uh, the guy's presence. left hand came out very quickly, and I touched it, and I looked right at him. I go, I'm with her. 
And he goes, I didn't even see you there. I said, correct. What would you like? He goes, I'd like, I'd like to have an autograph. I go, okay, slow down. Let me have a piece of paper in your pen. And I would, he handed it to me. I handed it to her. She autographed it. I got it back and handed it to him. Mm. And then I put my finger to my lips and I go, shh, you know. And um, she goes, people don't even see you. He, I said, no, they're so focused on you. I'm kind of hiding in plain sight, which is the name of my book, you know. Right. <laughs> so you, you've talked about how your path as a martial artist has been a bit atypical. And right. there may be some folks listening who, you know, they're, they're kind of nodding along and they're saying, you know, I, I could see myself doing this. This is interesting. Right. It's more... How would they get started? Okay. So now they have the discipline of being a martial artist. Let's say they're at a, a fourth or fifth dawn level. Um, is, is what they're learning applicable to the street? What did the, what's the street come? How does that come at you? How would you visualize being attacked on the street with other people in, in the mix and a crowd situation and it's all close quarter combat? How do you visualize that based on the art that you're learning? Now, if they're learning, uh, if they're simply a boxer, which is, which is our Western martial art, would that be applicable? If they're doing uh, Wing Chun and they're trapping, would that be working within the industry? If they're a kicker but no hands, how would that look to you because you need a distance? So I would sit down and really interview them from a physical standpoint of view. Now, what else do you bring to the table that's going to be important? Because I looked at myself, what did I bring to the table that people found of value? And, and it's, again, it's going to be more than just martial arts. The discipline has to go beyond the, the physical and into that academic world. You know, how much are you willing to study in order to get into this world of close protection, which is the, probably the reason why martial arts was created to begin with is self-defense and protecting the emperors and so forth. Now, I brought that into a full circle of being that modern-day samurai, if you will, or, or protectee from China. And, um, and it just it, it doesn't end. You don't, again, don't rest on your laurels just because you're a fourth or fifth degree black belt that you you say that's good enough. And I've heard a lot of people say that, well, I've got this level. Okay, are you still training really hard? Well, no, but I know the moves. You know, I, I, I would say, let's go down to the gym. Let me see these. Let me to see these things and let me tweak them so they are applicable in the street. Because if you're throwing a really high kick, then you're standing on one foot and you could be unbalanced fairly quickly doing that um so let's get your kicks down a little bit lower if that's what you think you'd be doing you know so i analyze a lot of different arts and how it's going to apply in the street atmosphere um and, and what else do you have what what do you what's your temperament like do you know do you get rattled easily and it's okay it's a human nature to have a certain sense of fear and how can you let that how can you make that work for you are you is it anxiety that you're worried about you do you get nervous easily um you know what do you do you take medication do you have to have a drink and that's that's a no-no um a lot of different things that i ask that makes the agent valuable to me so I don't have to worry so much. If this guy, if a person I hire has a short temper, that wouldn't mm -hmm. that wouldn't work because there's many times that people get in your face and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you have to reframe their minds. But if you get play the game of getting involved with that negativity negative attitude, it's not gonna work for you. You know, you've got to be the consummate professional. You've got to, you've got to be, if you're working a corporate world, you've got to look like the corporate person, a businessman. If you're in the entertainment industry, like I was um, a number of times, 
Um, I don't shine. I dress in a very casual way. And um, like in, in another story that I'll talk about, I'm kind of hiding in plain sight. I'm not that big guy that they're looking for in the entertainment field. I'm a guy that can handle the situation, but I'm there and then I, I'm not there, but then I'm there if need be. Um, and there's a unique balance that, that is, um, that plays within the industry. I've been, I've been protecting people now for close to 40 years. So, you know, it's a science. It's a, training discipline and the training takes into account your academics um it doesn't stop i mean i just keep going it, it's just mm -hmm. i just have this insatiable appetite for learning more and training harder and that's always been part of who i am and i do find time to relax and have a wonderful girlfriend that just takes it all in and she's she's all part of it now <laughs> uh, you know um so, uh, I I hope that answers that question. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah it it, just, there's a lot to it that people don't under fully understand. It's not a security guard. It's not a bodyguard. And this is close protection. It's more of a science now. And it's not about firearms. I mean, I've been to so many countries that if I had a firearm, I'd, I'd be in prison for the rest of my life. Sure. And, and so I have to downplay it in such a manner that people wouldn't say anything until after I left, and they would probably say, "Who was that guy? Really? What? What did he? What was he here, here for?" You know. And I snuck in and out of countries, and it's gone quite well. And, and I, I have a way of being accepted within these countries, and the officials I have to talk to, they have no idea um, many times why I'm there, and. Um, you know, someone's executive assistant or something. Um, but, you know, along the way, after after working with Whitney and having a really um, interesting job with her, um, I went back to doing, I went back to my L.A. client, and that would have been 1997. Um, but I had a serious car accident along the way. In 97, I... Um, we we all look to the something distraction. You look to your right or left and so forth. So I looked to my right. As I turned my head, I hit a truck head on mm. and broke 15 ribs. Mm. And um, so I was in the hospital a few days. And so when I got out, I started walking, then running and lifting. And it was about six months later. Uh, Maybe four months later, I'm still work. I'm starting working the bag some more and so forth. And who showed up is my buddy from Hollywood. All these years later, he goes, "You've been doing any sparring?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure. Put the gloves on." So he went to kick me, and I caught him with my elbow to his toes and broke three of his toes. He got mad, kicked me in the ribs, and I said, "Nice kick." I said, "You want to keep going?" He said, "No, I'm out of here." <laughs> so he left. <laughs> so about two months later, I was fully healed and. Um, I've been great. It's been, that was just kind of a bump in the road. Um, so then I just, I, you know, I kept, you know, just working more jobs, uh, with my corporate guy. He always treated me very, very well. And then, uh, 98, my daughter said, we we're listening to quit playing games with my heart by the Backstreet Boys. She said, why don't you work for those guys? And I said, well, I, you know, I just can't call him up and say, you know, I, I, I need a job and can you hire me? So two weeks later, I get a call from a gentleman friend of mine. His name is Randy Jones. And he said, uh, hey, Tom, you want to go back on tour? I said, not really. I said, it's just, you know, kind of hard. I have a client in, from L.A. I said, who is the client? And they said, Backstreet Boys. So I called my daughter. I said, Jamie, I have a chance of working with the Backstreet Boys. And I think I still hear her scream today, you know. So, so I said, okay, I'll take the job. So within three months, I was their new head of security and uh, going to South America and all over the place and award shows and um, just different things with them. Um, when we got to Europe, I have got a phone call from someone at the Vatican and said, um, can we put together a meeting with the Pope 
I'm like, sure. So here I'm traveling through Europe, walk, talk, talking with bishops and cardinals and um, trying to get audience with the Pope. So I have a nice letter that talks about that, you know, uh, my job. And uh, a couple of the guys got to see the Pope and sit down with him and so forth. Uh, but that was a wonderful job to, to kind of a side job to work on uh, with the Backstreet Boys. Um, just prior to that, however, I got a call in Birmingham, England. Uh, we have a, uh, a, um, a person of royalty that wants to go to the concert. Can you make sure that happens safely? I go like, sure. So it was uh, Princess Beatrice, uh, Sarah's daughter, Sarah Ferguson's daughter. She came in with her security guys. And I told them where to sit, enjoy the show. When I tell you we're ready to leave, we need to leave. And um, they said, okay. So it was just about time for them to do an encore and everybody's clapping and stamping their feet. And I walked around, let's go. So we went out a back door and got them in the car. And uh, her head of security said, uh, her mother will be in touch with you. And so not long after that, I called my parents up. And they had a, a letter with a red seal on it. And Sarah Ferguson had written a letter of thank you for taking care of her daughter. Uh, so a lot, lot of good things like that. that yeah, uh, so it sounds yeah. like it. Let, let's talk more specifically about the book. You've mentioned the book. Yeah. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of stuff that would, would dovetail in with what we've talked about. And I would imagine yeah. that anybody who's enjoyed the stories would probably enjoy the book. <laughs> um, and, and you've got another one brewing. Yeah. Yeah. Where first off, where can they get it? What's what's okay. hiding in plain sight? It's called hiding in plain sight. My life and adventures protecting celebrities. So they can find it on Amazon using that title, or they can simply punch in Thomas LeBrun, and it will come up and it'll show a blue background with a jet on it in the back of my head, and um, you can get it in Kindle and or print book. Um, and it's been it's been going well, very well received. Um, I two years ago I wasn't even writing a book, so uh, you know I started writing in January of 2020. We got I got done writing the story in December, and then uh, two and a half months of editing, and then we put it out. And uh, so it hit the publisher's site. It's called Book Baby. It hit the publisher's site March 15th, but it didn't hit Amazon until May 5th. So that wasn't all that long ago. And so right now I'm a rated five-star book, and I've already won two awards, so I'm a multi-award winning author already. And I'm very proud of the project as to how it came out and the many letters of, of um, support that are in the book that validates each of the timelines um, that the book encompasses uh, for the 60 years uh, that the book uh, goes through. It's my autobiography. And many of the stories we talked about today are in there, but in a little bit more depth. Um, and, and, my, and also, it's a personal journey. Um, this story about me working with my dad and building stone walls and and um, always he would say something like, today we're working on a stone wall and we do that for about two hours and I go grab my gym bag. He says, where are you going? I said, dad, that was a warm up. I have to go work out now. You know, so he kind of shake his head. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. And uh, you said you're working on another book. What's that one about? Book, it's called, right now it's called Out of Time. So Out of Time is about two protectors and a female character. Um, and it's kind of a action-filled. There's some romance in there. Oh, it's fiction. Yeah, it's fiction. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. You you want to do something completely different. Yes. So I, I and I um years ago, back in the 90s, I was the editor-in-chief of a magazine called Executive Ops. And people wrote to me from all over the world and so forth. So I did some writing back then. So I just kind of got the bug after settling my parents' estate and, and started writing 
the first book. And then the second book, I'm like, well, I'm going to write something very creative that's loosely based on my life, I guess. And it's called Out of Time and um, just the adventures of these three people with their backstories. And, and there's martial arts involved in there. And there's some funny antidotes that I put in there. And there's foreign language. And uh, I'm hoping it comes out like next spring or so. It should be, I'm having fun writing it. So I'm on chapter seven right now, 10,000 words into it. Um, so that again, I, I do that because either I read every night or I um, write. So that's the, the, the nerd in me is coming back out again. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it gives me a, I don't know. It's just fun. It's just a lot of fun writing and, and, and having a story that people can read and enjoy, just like hiding in plain sight. What we've gotten, and I include my girlfriend on this, is that we've gotten comments. This was a well written story. This was a story that I really enjoyed, or I thought I knew more about you than that, but I guess not. There's much more to you than than just lifting weights or just doing your martial arts all these years. And, um, you know, I said, well, there is, you know. But one thing I want to talk about just briefly about my martial arts, how did I get to the level that I that I am now? And yeah. this is also in the book. So I'm at Hanshu level, which is ninth dawn. And in the 2009 I created a system called American Combatives, and it was first recognized by Grandmaster John Kanzler out of Pittsburgh. And he said, well, you've got something there that enables you to protect people, and it's realistic self-defense. This is, this is pretty neat. But it wasn't until 2017 I got a phone call right here at the house downstairs, and it was Shidoshi Glenn Perry out of Chicago, uh, Illinois, uh, not out of Chicago, but in the Illinois area. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've never met Glenn and, and his name come up on my caller ID. And I go, yes, sir. And he goes, your, your name has been put in the hat concerning your system of American combatives as a, a 21st century martial art. I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> I, have to, I, have, I don't know what to say. I, I still get goosebumps about that phone call. And he goes, do you accept? I said, well, yes, I do. And he goes, well, there's going to be a big ceremony for you. Uh, you pick the place. We'll put it together, and we'll have the certificates ready for you. And I'm like, okay, um, this is great. It's super. So that that's another reason why I train so hard, because – they put Shidoshi Glenn Perry, who else signed my certificate? Grandmaster Ron Van Cleef mm. signed my certificate. What an honor. I told both of these gentlemen, I said, since you put my, your name on my certificate, the standard of my training will be increased tenfold. And they're like, we wouldn't expect anything less from you. I'm like, thank you. So... That gave me more incentive to train harder. <laughs> I, get that. I, I absolutely get that. You got you got to you got to rise to I, I guess the the occasion. Yes. So that was just a huge thing, and so now you know I've studied pressure points and the meridians and all that stuff, which opens up the door for a whole bunch of more things. And so in the last couple of years, I've been, you know, the Hall of Honors, uh, Alan Goldberg's uh, mm -hmm. place two years in the 2019, 2020. And then Cliff um, uh, Clepper has the Karate Kung Fu Award Ceremony. And I couldn't make it this year, but he he's told me I was up for an award. So they mailed me this trophy that I'm looking at right now. So I've been really recognized all these years as to the efforts and the heart that I have put into the martial arts to to make it something that is unique. But I don't think it's all that unique when we look back on, say, Bruce Lee did fencing and boxing and Wing Chun and Arnis and all that stuff. You know, he had that vision, and not that I'm comparing myself with him, but that's kind of what I did, but for a different reason, because I wanted to protect not only myself, but a third party that 
for whatever reason cannot protect themselves. And um, so I've made that work. And uh, I'm just, the journey's not over by a long shot. I'm just having, having a good time. Nice. Um, also, also, going back to my book, I, I, um, I describe what American combatives is in there. And it's making that bridge between realistic self-defense techniques and maybe um, uh, prearranged um, kata, if you will, how would you get, how would you bridge the gap between that? Because that's what I'm doing with different martial arts. Here's what you know now. How can we tweak that? That would make sense in the street. So I kind of blend, take what they have. Let's work with that instead of changing the whole thing around. It's just tweak it for, for protection of yourself or someone else in, in, in such a way that works for you because everything is unique. Everybody's built differently. And what I would yeah. teach you would be different than what I teach Andrew. You know, it's just a whole different ball game. And I can have that foresight in looking at it that way. Um, in my book also at the end is two pages of acknowledgements of people that have made me who I am today. Two full pages of acknowledgement mm. and uh, uh, Tom Pateri's in there, Michael D. Pasquale Jr. The number one on the list is my parents. And the whole book is dedicated to my parents. Um, they. Um, what did they think of what you did? Um, well, my dad, back in 2001, I got a phone call. It's always about this phone call. <laughs> And uh, I was number five on the list to work for a major corporate person out west. Then a week later, um, I when somebody dropped out, so I had a 25% chance. About a week and a half later, somebody else dropped out. I had a 33% chance of working for this major corporate person. About now we're going into the first week of September 2001, and another person dropped out. So now I have a 50% chance of working for this person. My dad said to me, what makes you think you're good enough to work for this individual? I said, well, dad, there's only two of us. And now they're curious as to who I am. And uh, I'm pretty good at what I do. Being, being a former bricklayer that he was, he could never, I don't know if he could ever really wrap his head around me creating a business out of nothing and then suddenly traveling around the world with top entertainers and corporate people. So I flew out to um, out west on September 7th. September 8th, I got a phone call and said, do you want the job? I said, yes, I do. So September 9th, I flew back home here to Enfield. September 11th happened, 9-11 happened. And they said, when can you get out here? So I flew out on the 14th. So who did I work for? It was Bill Gates. So the top man on the corporate totem pole. Um, I was very uh, honored. I was very pleased that my computer skills needed a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that my, they just, they, they didn't know. My, my mother would always say, just be careful. And my dad would try to figure it out from a business standpoint of view. How could his son be that good at protecting because he knows me as his son, as someone that works out, as someone that used to run a gas station? Mm. How, where did this happen that I'm that good that I could work for Whitney Houston? And, and they got to meet Whitney and all these other people um, along the way. Um, they just, I think he kept scratching his head. Like, how did this happen? You know, he didn't get it. Just didn't. Yeah, not. I don't know if he didn't get it, but he just got how did it happen? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, another thing that that I think you would you would be kind of amazed at is we went back and we talked about Tony Robbins briefly. Yeah. So through the years, I kept listening to him, listening to him, and so forth. So February of two thousand one. I got a phone call and they said, we need you to do advance work to Rio de Janeiro. We have a client that wants to go to the carnival and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'll do the advance. And who's your, who's the client? They go, Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> so I got to meet Tony directly and was his personal guy. So all of these things, the, everything that I studied for, everything that I listened to came always in a full circle. And I'm just very, um, very pleased that I use the word blessed and fortunate that I found things that that I could do very well, but it wasn't without hard work and sacrifices and um, a lot of a lot of different things that make me that person that I um, here I am on the radio program with you kind of telling people you can do it you put your mind to it I'll even help you if they want to reach out to me or buy the book and ask questions from the book you know um, I will help them get to wherever they need it to be whether it's security or martial arts or so forth and steer them in the right direction mm -hmm. I have no problem doing that um, just, that's, that's really that's really generous you, you yeah. um obviously i would hope anyone who's going to ask for advice on getting into security would buy the book that you wrote yeah. after your career on security yes. uh, but if if people want to you know are you a social media guy is there I you am. know are there yeah. other websites emails anything that you want to share with the folks listening I so i'm all over facebook right now because this week this week i have a big book signing in white river junction vermont at the people's bank on the 10th friday uh, 11 to 3 so I'm all over Upper Valley, VTNH, um, Lebanon Alumni Association, Hanover Alumni Association, my own Facebook page, um, Who's Who at Martial Arts, uh, Legends, and so forth. Uh, I'm all over that. LinkedIn, I'm on there. Uh, that's more of my business security guys and, and gals. Um, I don't have a website as of yet because I've just been too busy with everything else going on. Um, but people can find me. I'm not, I'm not hard to find. Um, you know, there's just so much more that we've, we've covered a lot of stuff today and there's, there's even much more than what we covered that, um, oh, that, that I'm sure. like that. it's just, it's just amazing. Um, you know, just the, the training and all that stuff is just, uh, it's gone extremely well. I'm very pleased and, you know, have not been without injuries every once in a while. I'm a human being. Um, I'm not affected by kryptonite, so I'm okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> even better, even better. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so as as we wrap up here, you know, you've shared a lot of different stuff, a lot of really powerful, insightful stuff. But how do you want to close it up? You know, what are your what are your last thoughts to the people listening yeah. today? Um, I would say. You know, don't let anybody discourage you from your dreams. You know, live life to the fullest. Um, give life the best version of who you are, and and the reward you'll reap the rewards. I guarantee you, you really will. I mean, my whole journey has just been about living my dream, living a world of I can versus I'm not sure if I can. I can do many things. I mean, jumping up and kicking the net, working for the likes of Whitney Elton and Bill Gates. Um, recently, I had my picture taken with the governor of New Hampshire holding my book. Um, you know, go out and just make those things happen. If you, if you have those dreams, whatever that dream might be, make that happen for yourself. You know, have a sense of pride in, in, in how you've accomplished those things in your life. Don't let people discourage you. Um, create that momentum. If you can't create it, I'll help you. <laughs> I've, got, I've got plenty of momentum. And, and, and I want to have this book of mine, Hiding in Plain Sight, My Life and Adventures Protecting Celebrities, to be an inspirational tool that you could use as, actually as a workbook. Once you read it through, get a yellow highlighter, go in there and start making you know, highlighting passages in there that really resonate with you. Like, how do they get from point A to point B? Different people have, I have different um, uh, uh, sayings in there from from uh, Hawking, I think his name is Stephen Hawking. Yeah, Stephen Hawking. Um, he's got a powerful statement in there. Um, different Different people have contributed 
words of wisdom and words of encouragement. Um, I would say just use that book as a workbook, and then you can always refer to it. And, and it's not just a book you read and get all psyched up for five minutes and then put it up on a shelf. Keep it out there. Put it on your coffee table. Go back in there and start highlighting things. I'm here to motivate you. I'm here to inspire you. Um, I've had a wonderful life, and it's far from over. At the end of my book, you'll see an empty plate, and it says, empty plate to be filled again. So I'm filling it again. And here I am in my 60s. It's never too late to start. It's never too early to start. Just go, go with your feelings, you know, don't let, again, don't let people discourage you from what you, you want to get out of life. I mean, it's, it, life is, is something worth, you know, you have a, you, you nurture all these different things in your mind and your heart and say, I wish I could do this and go out and do it. Go out and make that happen. Mine just happened to be protecting people, martial arts, working out. And I think motivating people, those are the big things that um, take away from my book and my messages. Um, and I've had a great, great time. And, I, and I'm and i very blessed to be on the show with you, Jeremy. And um, hopefully people can, can grab my messages in, in, in such a way that they come back to you and say, I was blessed by this show. I was blessed by reading Tom's book. And uh, if they show up in White River, then then I, I'll shake hands, hug whatever they want, just to make sure they get the message. So that's me. I told you those were some good stories, some great names. And I can only imagine how many more stories went untold. I mean, I can't even imagine that any length book would fully encompass all the things that this man has done. and. You know, I'm blown away that he's in my backyard, so super pumped at the opportunities that that creates. I hope you'll check out the show notes at whistlecakemarshartsradio.com. I hope you'll consider the book, consider following him, just stay aware of what he's doing. This is somebody who took one of the, in my opinion, core principles of martial arts, avoiding fights. The ultimate in self-defense is avoiding a fight. And Tom's job was to professionally avoid fights for some of the wealthiest, most famous people on earth. Like, how cool is that? And what a great way to implement what we learn. Wouldn't surprise me if some of you out there are strongly considering getting into this field now, and and, and I hope you do, because somebody has to, and I'd rather be a martial artist. So, Hunchy, Tom, thanks for coming on the show. Really, I appreciate it, and look forward to our next chat, whenever that is. You listening. If you want to support us, remember, you've got a pile of ways you can do it. Everything from reviews and sharing and buying, Podcast 1-5, and the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And don't forget, we've got our training programs, like the free Flex program, but we've got a handful of others. Go to whistlekickprograms.com. You can check those out there. If you have guest suggestions or other feedback, I want to hear it. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere you might think of. And that brings us to the end. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 